So, yesterday I spoke about my pastimes with Srila Prabhupada here in Vrindavan and also in India. So today I'll speak about the pastimes in London and in Los Angeles. <coughs> <coughs> So people usually ask me, how did I meet Srila Prabhupada? I met Srila Prabhupada the first time through his devotees. And through his devotees, they took me to the temple. And I got some books. And I started reading the books. Eventually, I started to chant the Maha Mantra. And, uh, I was hearing classes of Srila Prabhupada, uh, but I couldn't, in the beginning, I couldn't follow his accent. But after some time, I was able to catch it. And so then I was relishing Prabhupada's books and his, his kata, his talks. Now, I was already into spiritual life since 1968 when I first came in contact with the Maha Mantra and Prashadam, but not through ISKCON or ISKCON devotees, but through the Indian community where I lived. And I met one gentleman, Mr. Sengupta, who's a Bengali. And we struck up a little friendship. And he would tell me about India, and I became very interested. And so he could see that I was interested. And so one weekend, he invited me to his home, Friday night, for dinner. So I went there and knocked on the door. He, and he invited me in introduced me to his wife who was in the kitchen cooking and then we sat and talked in the front room and then while we were speaking all of a sudden his wife came out of the kitchen with a tray she walked past us into another room put the tray down and started ringing a bell now i didn't know what was going on <laughs> but she was offering prashad so that meal was the first prasad I ever had. That was the beginning. That was a real contact with Vaishnav Krishna consciousness. And then we had very nice talks. And then before, just, you know, it was getting time to leave. So Mr. Sengupta asked me, he said, you know, we have our Indian community, we have a program every Sunday we gather together. Would you like to come for that program? So I said, okay. So Sunday morning around 11 o'clock, I arrived at that place. And I must have been a little late because when I walked in, the program was already going on. And people were sitting down like that. So I just came in in the back and sat down quietly on the floor in the back. And uh, up at the front, there was a little stage, only about one foot high, and there was musicians there, someone playing harmonium, someone playing vidanga, and someone playing these, not the cartels, but these hand things that you go like this. What are they called? Uh, and whatever. Yeah. <laughs> and they were singing, and you know, I love music, and so, I found it very attractive and it was new music for me but I could see that they were very expert and they were singing with a lot of heart, a lot of feeling. But then I noticed that they kept singing the same words over and over and over again. So I was trying to catch the words, it was in a different language obviously, but I was focusing really hard to hear what are the words 
And then gradually it came to me and the words were Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. And once I recognized the mantra from previous lifetimes, all of a sudden, right from my feet up to my body, I got a surge of emotion and tears came into my eyes. And I was a little bewildered. Why is this music affecting me like this? And I looked around at everybody else and they were smiling and happy and here I am, you know, emotionally with tears coming and I, I felt a little embarrassed. Anyway, finally I left and that was my first experience coming in contact with the Mahamantra and Prashadam with Mr. Sengupta. This was in 1968. And I had heard that about the devotees, about, I didn't know about ISKCON and everything, but I had heard that there were young men and women my age that were going in the streets and singing with drums in San Francisco. So, Mr. Sengupta, he said, oh, those are Vaishnavas. They have shaved head, and they wear our traditional clothes, and they go on the streets and they chant. So that was the first time I heard the word Vaishnava. For some reason, it stuck with me. I, I don't know why. Anyway, about seven or eight months later, I was walking in the downtown part of the town and I heard ching 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 ching. And I, this is now 1969, that was the summer of 68, so now it's the spring of 69. And I turned the corner and there was a group of ISKCON devotees chanting on the street corner. So I thought, oh, these must be the Vaishnavas Mr. Sengupta told me about. So I came there and I listened. And while I was standing there listening, someone came up to me and distributed Back to Godhead magazine. I gave it a donation. And then I took it back to my residence. Now I was already into spiritual life, into yoga. I was already vegetarian, but I was on the wrong path. I was reading Ram Krishna, Vivekananda, Paramahansa, Yogananda. <laughs> but he, t having, hearing that first Hare Krishna and tasting the prasad that I had done in the summer of 68, Krishna arranged that I would meet the devotees and hear the Mahamantra from the ISKCON devotees and get a Back to Godhead magazine, which I started to read but I couldn't understand it. I couldn't follow because it was different than the books that I had been reading, the Mayavadi books. So, you know, I, I had been entrenched in the Mayavadi type of philosophy. <coughs> and there was a group of our friends <coughs> who were into spiritual life. <coughs> then what, then uh, where I was staying, one, one of my friends went to see a guru who was giving a talk one evening. And then he came back and he said, oh, I've just had the greatest revelation from the guru. I said, oh, what is that? We're all God, I am God. I said, really, you're God? <laughs> he said, yeah. So I said, well, how come you didn't know that you were God? <laughs> he said, well, it's just like this. Sometimes you're looking for your keys and you can't remember where they are, and you're looking here and there and here and there, and then finally you find them. So it's like that. So I said, well, how is it that there's some other power that's so powerful that God can forget? You can make God forget. And he was stunned. He said, I can't answer that. But right away, this Mayavad philosophy was not sticking with me. You know, 
I couldn't accept that we're all God because I knew I wasn't God, therefore he couldn't be either. <laughs> anyway, the next thing happened was, this was in Canada. I was living in Canada, but I was born in London and I had a hankering to go back after I finished my education to go back to where I was originally born and brought up just to see what it was like. So I arrived in London and I had some friends I was staying with. And then one day, I'm walking in the center of town again <laughs> and I hear ching, ching, <laughs> ching, ching, ching. I turn the corner, there's the English devotees, Sankirtan party. And I thought, oh, they're here also. So one devotee came up to me, it was Mahavishnu Prabhu, who is now Mahavishnu Swami. And uh, I just remember him. I guess he gave me a book or something. And then I met Charanaravindam. He's the one who made this uh, lotus fountain. But I met him first in London. And I bought some books from him also. So this was 1972, and then I went to the temple. But by 1972, I was very much deep into Kundalini Yoga. <clears throat> I was doing pr pranayama, yama niyama, pranayama, pratyahara, dhyan, all these things, trying to raise the Kundalini Shakti to the Brahmarandra to experience oneness. And I was, the pranayama that I was doing was, you know, this kind of pranayama and also breath of fire. <laughs> yeah. And I was studying from one Swami, his name was Narayanananda Swami, and he had a book out and I was following his directions, his books and everything. And, you know, very austere. Um, for two months, I was only taking two foodstuffs, goat's milk and date. I would take a little drink of goat's milk and a bite of date, chew them together. For two months, that's all I was eating. <laughs> and doing this pranayam, breath of fire, trying to receive enlightenment. I was, I was really wanting you know, to know what is the real goal of life. And I was reading Bhagavad Gita because I had gotten the books. <clears throat> so I was reading Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita and that was like very eye-opening and I was still following the Rayanananda Swami's book on Kundalini Yoga. And then I got to the very end of his book, the last chapter, and on the last chapter, on the last page, he writes, there are other ways to raise the Kundalini experience enlightenment and he gave two other ways one was japa the other was kirtan <laughs> so then i was thinking why am i doing all this <laughs> heavy austerity breath of fire i should just go to the Hare krishna temple you know <laughs> do kirtan <laughs> get the same experience <clears throat> so that's how i came closer and closer to iskan and um, then in 19, that was 1972, then in 1973, George Harrison donated, he purchased the Bhaktivedanta Manor and donated it. And then the devotees were asking whoever wants to come out and help convert this huge manor house into a temple. So I would go out there and, and help. And I remember the very first time I went there, I arrived and there was a big sign. Now if you go there, the sign says Bhaktivedanta Manor. But in those days, the sign said Piggott's Manor. That was the original name, Piggott's Manor. <laughs> anyway, I remember this one time I came and devotees were sweeping and putting up pictures and washing and running around taking out tr rubbish and everything. It's busy, busy, busy. And then Mahavishnu saw me again. He came running up. He says, can you paint? Yeah, I can try. So he goes off and he comes back with a can of gold paint. He says, go paint the Vyasasan gold. 
So I went over to the Vyasa, and it was a new Vyasa they had just made. It's all wood. And then I'm sitting there painting it gold. And I'm watching everybody running around. <laughs> and I'm thinking, I have the best service. <laughs> because the neophyte's always thinking, I have the best service. <laughs> anyway, not long after that Pigott's Manor became Bhaktivedanta Manor, and deities arrived and Prabhupada arrived. So then I had association with Prabhupada. Now the very first time I saw Prabhupada, because there was a Rathiyatra at the same time, at the grand opening of the manor. So the first time I saw Prabhupada was at that Rathayatra festival in 1973, in the summer of 1973. It started, anybody here from London? Nobody. Anyway, it started from a place called Marble Arch and it went down Oxford Street to Oxford Circus, turned down Regent Street to Piccadilly Circus, and then went down the Haymarket to Trafalgar Square. It was you know, several miles. So I arrived there, and Prabhupada was originally, he had come and was sitting on the cart, uh, Subhadra Maharani's cart. But then when the kirtan started up, Prabhupada became very enthusiastic, and he got off the rut and was in with the devotees doing kirtan. And there was one sannyasi named Rabatanandan Swami. So Rabatinandan Swami, he was on the cart with a microphone and they had speakers and everything and he led the kirtan from on top of the rat cart through a microphone. So it was powerful, it could, could be heard. And then the devotees were the parade started and the devotees were chanting and there was a circle around Srila Prabhupada and he was chanting and dancing and devotees were chanting and dancing. So the first time I saw Prabhupada he was chanting and dancing. Now he chanted and danced that whole way from the beginning to the end of that Rathiyatra. He was 77 years old at that time but he was dancing with arms raised up like young man and surrounded by devotees just as a protection because you know there's crazy people out there <clears throat> and sometimes in Rathayatra Lord Jagannath's cart stops and then the kirtan party goes on and then they realize they stop and they see the cart way that that happened several times so then Prabhupada would turn around and just stand in one place dancing and the devotees would stay in one place now the police were following the Rathayatra and because that's what their duty is, to make sure that everything goes smoothly. But when they saw that the Prabhupada and the devotees were staying in one place, they didn't like that. So they called over one devotee. And uh, they said, tell your Swami to keep moving, keep moving. Okay. Of course, who's going to tell Prabhupada to keep moving? <laughs> but you say yes, and then you go. Meanwhile, the the Hibrathyatra is coming closer, so then the kirtan moves on. Then again, it happened that the kirtan party was too far ahead of the, the, the Hibrathyatra cards. So again, this time the police, they, they didn't like the first person. They didn't get any result from him, so they called over Shruta Kirti. And they said, can you please tell your master, keep moving, keep moving. Oh, yes. But of course, he's not going to go tell around. <laughs> so this is like the whole parade was like this until we got to Trafalgar Square. And Trafalgar Square was a nice festival set up with so many booths, and the place was packed. We had many people following the parade. And then they all ended up at Trafalgar Square. Plus, there were already so many people in Trafalgar Square. I don't know if it was a Saturday or a Sunday, but on the weekends, it's always packed. And in the middle of Trafalgar Square, there's a big plinth about a meter and a half high. And then there's four lions on each corner. And then in the center is a big column called Nelson's Column. So on one side, facing 
in the direction of the National Galleries, which is a big museum of art. Prabhupada's Vyasasan was set up, was the one that I painted. <laughs> and next to him, they were building a fire yajna, a fire pit. And Prabhupada gave a little talk, and then he was going to present a the Vedic marriage. He wanted people to see what is Vedic marriage. And one couple, Vidyabhadu Devidasi, and um, what was his name? It'll come back to me. They sat there, and there were all the svahas, and they got married. Prabhupada did the marriage ceremony. Now, Prabhupada didn't do the fire yagya himself. Someone else did. He just sat on the Vyasa sun. And then after the svahas and everything, they got up and walked around the flame. <laughs> so they were presenting to the people of London, this is a Vedic Vivaha Yagya. So that was very nice. And I, was, I remember being in the crowd and people coming up and asking questions. And they say, well, we're into yoga. I say, oh, this is yoga. This is bhakti yoga. But in those days, nobody knew what was bhakti yoga. No one had ever heard of bhakti yoga. It was a completely new thing. Now, everybody knows bhakti yoga, but in those days, people only knew hatha yoga in the western countries and in London. Then there was one Mataji, and she was very, she preached to me a lot. And uh, she took more time to preach to me than anybody else. And uh, I had a jacket that I liked very much, but it was made of leather. But no one told me, don't wear a leather jacket. So one day, she decided she was going <laughs> to. But she did it in such an intelligent way. She didn't say, oh, this is Maya, this is a killed dead a cow was killed or anything like that. She just said, you know, that jacket, it's not very flattering to you. <laughs> she appealed to my ego. You should get something that really brings out the, the real you. Hey, let's go shopping and get you something really nice. <laughs> so, I, so that's how I got rid of the leather jacket. <laughs> and I got a nice jacket that was pakka. <laughs> and uh, she, I, I, was, I was coming closer and closer to Krishna consciousness. And... Uh, then after the Ratha Yatra, Prabhupada was sitting, he was staying at the Bhaktivedanta Manor. He had his rooms there. And then he would have darshan, like for after the Sunday feast, there'd be a big darshan. And the place was packed, full of people, very interested, mostly young people interested in yoga and spiritual life. And I remember this one darshan Prabhupada was very grave, he was speaking, but there, over on my left side, there were some hippies there, and they were asking Prabhupada's questions in a challenging way. And Prabhupada was very grave and trying to answer, but I didn't, I didn't appreciate the way they were speaking or their mood. So the next question, I, I just turned around to them. I don't know what I said, but I chastised them. <laughs> Told them to shut up or something like that. Don't talk so stupid. And then all of a sudden I felt funny. Maybe I shouldn't have done that. And I looked up and Prabhupada was looking right at me. Very grave. He didn't smile, he was just the same. He was completely grave. He had no idea what was going on inside because his outside was always the same, very grave. That was in the temple. Now, on other occasions, he would come out to the garden and sit on the lawn and the grass on a sunny afternoon. And then he was very jolly. And he was very friendly. One of my god sisters, uh, Svati Devi Dasi, she had a little boy. His name was Shiva Drada. And he was only about two years old. And Prabhupada loved to hold his hand and to interact with him. Prabhupada loved children. If you've ever seen some of the videos of Srila Prabhupada on his Vyasa-san, before he gives class, 
and the devotees bring him a big basket of biscuits and he's and the mothers bring their children up and he's giving biscuits to every child one by one even the little botches that they can't even walk yet mata brings them up and they put their hand out to get biscuit <laughs> so Prabhupada loved the children he was so sweet so but I didn't stay in London very long and uh, the, 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 not long after that, in the beginning of 1974, I left London and then I went to Canada, Toronto. I was in Toronto Temple. I was there for the Rathiatra in Toronto. So Rathiatra in London, then Rathiatra in Toronto. But then again, I didn't stay very long. Even then, I, I was always moving. So I went to Los Angeles, but that was the best move I ever did because Prabhupada, for Prabhupada, Los Angeles was the Western world headquarters. So he was always there and he spent a lot of time there. So being in Los Angeles, I had so much association with Prabhupada. So I'll share with you 1975, February 8th and February 9th. Prabhupada flew in from Honolulu, Hawaii, and he arrived in Los Angeles around noon on February the 8th. Because he arrived at, in the middle of the day, there was no morning program with him, no Bhagavatam class. But the, and the devotees had arranged for the evening, instead of a Gita class, they had, the devotees had been rehearsing a drama and the, the drama troupe was called the Vaikuntha Players. And they were going to do a drama called The Pandavas Retire Timely. And this is from a chapter in the Srimad Bhagavatam, first canto. And it's, the story tells about after the Kurukshetra War. Then the Pandavas are ready now to retire. But anyway, so that evening, Prabhupada came down for the Sundar Arati, and it was a temple room was packed. I mean, packed. It was so packed that people couldn't get in. They were, the doors to the temple room were open, and people would be looking in from outside and through windows and everything. So. Then after the kirtan, Prabhupada sat down on his Vyasasan to watch the drama. Now in Los Angeles temple, the deities are here and the Vyasasan is here, facing this direction. And the doors for the temple room are over there. It's a big, big temple room in Los Angeles. And so there was a little stage, just a small little stage, on this side of the room that they set up. And then Prabhupada sat on the Vyasasana and we all sat in front of Prabhupada to watch the drama. He was behind us. So in the first act, there was Arjuna and Yudhisthira, and they're discussing that this battle of Kurukshetra, it's horrible why we should have to fight. And Dhritarashtra, they had gone to see Dhritarashtra and Gandhari. They're saying we shouldn't have this battle. We're all family. These people are going to be killed. All the wives will become widows. All the young ladies, they won't have any husbands to marry because they're all going to be dead. It's terrible. But Dhritarashtra could do nothing to alleviate the situation. So then Arjuna and Yudhisthira decide, well, we have to go and ask Krishna. So that was act one. Act two, there, Krishna arrives, and the three of them are talking. And the acting was so good. Krishna was unbelievable, the way he looked. <laughs> anyway, so they were discussing, and then Krishna came up with a plan. So they agreed, this is a good plan, let's present it to Duryodhana. 
So act three, they're in the palace of Duryodhana. And uh, Yudhisthira speaks to Duryodhana. He says, you know, we've been discussing that this war, so many people are going to die, so many wives are going to be left widows, the young ladies won't have anyone to marry. It's going to be, it's a fratricidal war. It's going to destroy our whole dynasty. So we've come up with a plan to solve the problem of the war. So Duryodhana said, what is that plan? So Yudhisthira said, we are five brothers, Pandavas, and we're Kshatriyas. So we need to govern something. So we suggest, why don't we just have five villages and then you can have 95% of the kingdom. You can have everything. And we'll just take five villages for each of us to govern over. And then we don't have to fight. No one will be killed. Now, how many people think that was a good plan? Duryodhana didn't think it was a good plan. He's thinking, aha, they know they're going to lose. And they're trying to salvage five villages. And then he said, very dramatically, I will not give you as much land as you can put under the head of a pin. And at that point, everybody turned around to look at Srila Prabhupada. It was such a dramatic moment. And my god brother, Madhava Prabhu, he was so good as Duryodhan. So he looked, everybody turned around to look at Prabhupada. Prabhupada was not happy. <laughs> and it meant many times during the play, some dramatic point, everyone would turn around to see how Prabhupada was reacting. Anyway, to make it a long story short, the war goes on. And then the last act is in the palace of Dhritarashtra and Gandhari again. And Yudhisthira and Arjuna are there, and they say that all your sons have been killed, everyone's been killed. There's no use staying in the palace anymore. We should all go to the north, go to the Himalayas, retire, meditate in the forest, and go back home, back to Godhead. Preaching like that. And then Gandhari, she, you know, she had a blindfold on. And Dhar uh, Dhritarashtra, they both slowly got up and walked off stage, along with Yudhisthira and Arjuna. That was the end of the play. And everybody applauded. It was beautiful. It was about an hour. It was a brilliant play. Then we all turned around to face Prabhupada. And Prabhupada was beaming ear to ear. He was so happy. He just loved it. And everyone was so happy that Prabhupada was so happy. <laughs> and then because it was Los Angeles, Prabhupada said something quite humorous. He said, so... The Oscar goes to Yudhisthira. <laughs> he gave an Academy Award Oscar to Yudhisthira. And everybody went, Hari Bol! And Yudhisthira, he was played by my god brother, Loka Mangala Prabhu. So he came forward very humbly. Prabhupada blessed him. <laughs> and everyone was so happy. And, uh, The thing about Mang Loka Mangala, he was the only disciple of Srila Prabhupada that ever got an Oscar. No one else got an Oscar from Prabhupada, <laughs> only Loka Mangala. And everyone was so happy, smiling, and you know, offering pranams to Yudhisthira, I mean to Loka Mangala Prabhu. But then gradually Prabhupada became a little more serious. And as he became more serious, the room became more quiet. And then he became very serious, and the room became very quiet. And then he became very grave. And that temple room was so quiet, you could hear people breathing. And we were all waiting, what's Prabhupada going to say? And then after some time, he spoke. This is what he said. He said, my Guru Maharaj ordered me to spread the teachings of Krishna consciousness 
to the English-speaking countries in the Western world. And now, I'm very happy to say that Lord Chaitanya's movement is in the right hands. And he went like this. Lord Chaitanya's movement is in the right hands. Like he was giving us Lord Chaitanya's movement and our hands were the right hands. And we were all shocked. Everyone was looking around, whose hands? No one was thinking, <laughs> my hands are the right hands. We were all looking around like that. And then Prabhupada said, the grandfather is more kind to the children than the father. Therefore, my Guru Maharaj will be more kind to you, American boys and girls, than he will be to me. I always remembered that. And whenever I was doing some preaching anywhere and something really good happened, I always thought, wow, Bhakti Siddhanta must be giving me special mercy. Prabhupada said, the grandfather gives more mercy than the father. And uh, over the years, many people come to me and they say, you're so fortunate. You're Prabhupada's disciple. You were there. You had his association. You're the most fortunate. And I say, no, no, no. You are more fortunate because the grandfather is more kind <laughs> to the children than the father. So Prabhupada is going to give you more mercy than you give to us. <laughs> I always tell people that. You are more fortunate. <laughs> because I heard Prabhupada speak that right there. And then Prabhupada became very grave. And he said, if I have any, oh, oh no, what, yeah, if I have, no, before that he said, by the mercy of my spiritual master, he has sent all of you boys and girls to help me. So he didn't take the credit for himself. He gave the credit to his disciples. He said, what can an old man do? I'm just an old man, what can an old man do? But my Guru Maharaj was so kind upon me, he sent all of you, American boys and girls, to help me. So he wasn't taking any credit. He was giving the credit to his disciples. And then he said, if I have any credit, it is just one thing. That I have given and brought the the uh, teachings of Sri Krishna, the teachings of the Parampara, I have brought it to you without adding, without subtracting, as it is. So that's what Prabhupada said was his one credit, that he brought the teachings as it is, he didn't change anything. And then he gave an example. He gave an example of a postman, but he didn't use the word postman. We understood it was the postman, but he used the word um, peon. Do they call postmen peons in India? Anyway, he said, just like a peon gets a letter from the government and delivers it to the home of the citizen. Similarly, I'm delivering to you, and, and the, the peon doesn't open up the envelope and change anything. He delivers it as it is from the government to the citizens. Similarly, I'm bringing you the message of the Supreme Government, Sri Krishna, directly to you as it is, nothing added, nothing subtracted. That was Prabhupada's humility. I only have, if I have, if I have any credit. He didn't even say I have one credit. If someone says I have a credit, then at least through this one thing that I gave you the parampara without adding or subtracting anything. So I was really struck by Prabhupada's humility. Because at that point in 1975, we had 60 or 70 temples, or more even, and it was flourishing all over the world. And Prabhupada was giving all the credit to his disciples. So that was February the 8th, the evening. Then February 9th, <coughs> Prabhupada gave the Bhagavatam class, and then it, it was announced by the temple president after the class that 
After breakfast, Prabhupada will be going to the airport to catch a flight to Mexico. Mexico City was his next. Actually, he toured the BBT offices, and then he was going to go to Mexico. And uh, the temple president said, if anyone wants to go to the airport and see Srila Prabhupada off at the airport, feel free to do so. Prabhupada very much liked when the devotees went to the airport and he could spend some time with them before he left. He liked that very much. A final darshan, very intimate, very friendly. It's like when in, in India, anybody goes to the airport to fly, the whole family comes, you know. So we were Prabhupada's family. He wasn't going to go to the airport alone. <laughs> so, so we all got in our cars and went to the airport. And then we were sitting in the departure lounge. Prabhupada was sitting on some chairs. And <clears throat> we were all sitting on the floor. And people were asking questions, and Prabhupada was answering, and it was a very wonderful uh, darshan, wonderful experience. Then, over the loudspeaker, it announced that the Mex flight to Mexico was now ready for boarding, and anyone who is on this flight, please get up and come to board the, the flight. So Prabhupada stood up, and when he stood up, the devotees parted like this to uh, allow a way for him to walk. And we all offered our obeisances. I was on this side, right where the path was. And we were all offering our obeisances, and Prabhupada started walking. So I was thinking, let me have a look, see Prabhupada's lotus feet <laughs> as he walked by. So he was almost near me, and I, you know, I looked, he was wearing these wonderful slippers, colored slippers. And then I was thinking, well, everyone's closing their eyes, saying um, the, the pranam mantras. So I forgot to mention one thing. When the temple president announced that everybody should go to visit, to see Srila Prabhupada off at the airport, he said, but be careful, don't try to touch Prabhupada's feet. Be very respectful. So now here I was, my eyes were open, Prabhupada's feet were just about in front of me, and everyone's offering pranams. I was thinking, no one's going to see who's going to mind, you know. So I reached out, touched Prabhupada's feet, put it in my head, and finished my pranam mantras. And then as Prabhupada walked by, everybody got up, and Prabhupada, of course, walked down towards the plain, and we all went to the windows. And through the windows, packed with devotees, we could see Prabhupada getting on the plane, and then the plane going down onto the runway, and then, and then going really fast and going up into the sky. We were all watching, and then it went this way, and then that way, it got smaller and smaller, farther and farther away, until it was just a dot, and then it disappeared. And we were there the whole time. <laughs> Couldn't take our eyes off the plane. And then when it disappeared, so we thought, okay, we go back to the temple. So we're all walking back to the temple, down the corridor. Then all of a sudden, the temple president sees me and he comes running up. He said, I saw you! <laughs> he was... Apparently, he was standing and surveying everything. He saw me touch Prabhupada's lotus feet. I told you not to do it. You, were, you are so unsurrendered. You're not even a Vaishnava. And he was blasting me. You have no good qualities. <laughs> and I was saying, yes, you're right. I was agreeing. Everything he said, I agreed. I'm the most fallen. I have no good qualities. But inside, I was very happy. <laughs> Externally, I was agreeing with him, but internally, I was happy. <laughs> because I read Prabhupada's books and taking the dust of the lotus feet of Maha Bhagavad Vaishnava. This is the highest, most wonderful thing you can do. <laughs> so that was that experience. <laughs> then the next time that Prabhupada came, he came 
three times to Los Angeles, in February, in June, and in July. And then he went to the San Francisco Ratha Yatra, which was the end of June. So I saw him four times, three times in Los Angeles and one time in San Francisco. So the next time he came, <coughs> he was very ecstatic. We were all looking forward so much. And I was like really focused on hearing Srila Prabhupada and seeing him again. And I remember one class, he made some very uh, strong points. And uh, I'll share with you some of the things he said in that class, the Bhagavatam class. <coughs> so one of the things he said is, devotees must become fixed up. Fixed up means solid. So that you don't fall down. So when he said fix up means solid, I didn't know what he really meant. Fixed up means solid. But after meditating on it and reading Srila Prabhupada's books, what he meant was solid Krishna consciousness. No gaps for maya, no holes for maya to come in. Ahoitaki apratiyata, uninterrupted and unmotivated devotional service 24 hours a day. That's what he meant. So being fixed up in devotional service means solid, solid Krishna consciousness, 24 hours a day, no gaps for Maya to come in. So that was one thing he said. And, and another thing he said, he said, so, if you follow all my instructions that I have given you, the chanting of the japa, going out on Sankirtan, attending the RTs, you know, honoring Mahaprasad, studying the books, then I guarantee in this life you go back home, back to Godhead. Prabhupada gave a guarantee. And in the Brahmacharya Ashram, after breakfast, we were all talking about it after the class. Wow, Prabhupada gave a guarantee. We're all going back to Godhead. This is so easy. We were thinking it's going to be so easy to go back to Godhead. <laughs> of course, you're only a few years in the movement. You don't know what it's like. <laughs> the obstacles and the challenges over 50 years. We don't know that. But we were thinking, oh, the piece of cake. We're going back to Godhead. <clears throat> But then some people were asking questions. They said, well, what if I'm not completely pure at the time of death? How can I go back to Godhead? Different people were asking different questions like, well, how can Prabhupada give that guarantee? I thought Krishna is the one that takes us back to Godhead. So we had questions, but we didn't have answers. We were young brahmacharis, new devotees. But I meditated on these things uh, because I read in Prabhupada's books that Krishna fulfills your desires. So if you want desire to know something, you just go deep, be, and com contemplate on it, and Paramatma, Chaita Guru in the heart, will reveal the answer. <clears throat> so about Prabhupada giving the guarantee, then Krishna revealed to me Declare it boldly, Arjun, my devotee never perishes. Then I realized, oh, Krishna told Prabhupada to say it. Declare it boldly, Srila Prabhupada. If your disciples follow your instructions, they're guaranteed to go back to Godhead. Then I understood why Prabhupada say, said that, because Krishna had informed him. And then, how can you go back to Godhead if, what if you're not 100% pure, only 90% pure? And then I was given that uh, uh, realization also by Sri Krishna. Sarva Dharma Paditya Ja Mame Kang Shanaram Vraja. You just surrender, make Krishna number one in your life. Aham Kong Sarva Pape Bhyo. And I will take away all your sinful activities. Sarva means all. All pap karma, past, present, and future. Krishna will take away. So then I realized, 
I can't, if, if I'm not Paka myself, Krishna can take care of the last 10%, you know. And then he says, Ma Suchaha, don't worry about it. When you tell someone something and then you say, don't worry, what does it really mean? It means don't have any doubts, right? And when you tell something to someone and you don't have any doubts, that's a negative way of saying, trust me. So Krishna revealed to me that ma sutjaha, the positive way of saying that is trust me. We have to trust Krishna. And another realization I got was that this was our biggest problem in spiritual life. We didn't fully yet trust Krishna. We didn't have 100% full faith and trust in Krishna. And even Arjuna didn't. That's why Krishna said to Arjuna, Na Sutraha, don't worry, you know, just follow my instructions. Because Arjuna was ready to, I can't get involved in this war. My hand is shaking, my Gandiva bow is slipping from my hands. I've lost my composure, I, my memory is gone like this. So after preaching to him, Prabhupada, I mean, Krishna said to Arjuna, Ma Suchaha, don't worry, just trust me. So we, that's what we have to do. We have to trust Krishna. So, and then, uh, then uh, Prabhupada left to go to San Francisco for the Rathiatra festival. And we all got into the, the the, the temple, Los Angeles temple had a bus. We all got in the bus. We all went up to San Francisco. It was the 1975 Rath Yatra. It was a fantastic Rath Yatra. It was the best Rath Yatra I had ever been to. I had been to the one in London, the one in Toronto, and now in San Francisco. So I was in, in that Rath Yatra. And then all of a sudden, as we're going through the park, there was a bridge that the Rath had to go under. And I looked at the bridge and I looked at the Rath car and I thought, oh my God, it's not gonna make it. <laughs> I was a new devotee. The devotees, they've forgotten. That someone made a mistake. <laughs> and I was in a great anxiety and then all of a sudden, the top came lowering down. <laughs> it was my, I'd never seen that before. <laughs> First time I saw it, 1975, and it went under the bridge. <laughs> so that was <laughs> pretty ecstatic. And then Prabhupada came back to Los Angeles, and we all came back to Los Angeles also. And then, uh, after Prabhupada had been there for a few days, he left, uh, and he came back to India. And there was some difficulty in India. This was the time of Indira Gandhi. There was a, I don't know what they called it, it was a, anyway, she was under emergency rule, and the, the ISKCON devotees from America, some people were saying they're CIA, they're only spies. So Prabhupada sent out a message, anyone who has a British Commonwealth passport, please come to America, uh, India, because we didn't need a visa. I flew to India, and I just walked right in. <laughs> they didn't, didn't ask to see anything. <laughs> Just there I was. That's how it was in those days. Now it's not like that. So because I was born in London, I had a British passport. So I went to my temple president. I said, oh, Prabhupada's asking for people to come to India. You should stay and do your service. No, look, I have British Commonwealth passport. Okay, well, you work now and go to Mayapur later. But Prabhupada's calling for us now. <laughs> <laughs> My temple president was right. I wasn't very surrendered. <laughs> so then he said to me, well, I see that no matter what I say, you're going to do whatever you want. I don't want you to commit an offense, so I'm going to give you my sanction to go. Because in those days, if you didn't follow your temple president, it was considered aparad. It was very strict in those days. And that's how I came to India. And then I told yesterday all the pastimes of India. So Hare Krishna. Are there any questions? Yes. There's uh, a lot of amazing things about Srila Prabhupada and his qualities. You hear me? Uh, if you speak louder, I can hear better. <laughs> Try. Uh, there's a lot of things amazing about Srila Prabhupada. And I wanted to ask you what was the most amazing thing personally for you in his personality and his qualities? 
Okay, the question is whether well, the, the qualities that most struck me about Srila Prabhupada. Well, one of them was his humility. He was so humble. He never took the credit for anything. He gave all the credit to his disciples. And he, he compared himself to a peon, just delivering a letter. <laughs> so he was so humble. But uh, I had a lot of association with him, Darshans, in India also. And he was very jolly, very friendly, and he saw everyone equally. He never found fault. He was always just encouraging. And he encouraged in such a wonderful way. Like I'll give you an example that happened with Shruta Kirti that he shared with me. When he first became Prabhupada's servant, one of the things he had to do was to cook. So he was cooking for Prabhupada, and he had joined in America, but then a few weeks later they came to Brindavan. So he was cooking for Prabhupada in Brindavan. And Prabhupada was eating everything that Shruta Kirti cooked. And then one morning, Srila Prabhupada said to Shruta Kirti, you know, today you don't have to cook. Our Jamuna has come, and she will cook lunch for us. So he, uh, Sri Tukhiti said, oh, okay. And Prabhupada said, and you can come and sit with me and take prasad with me. Really? Can I do that? Oh, yes. If I say you can, then you can. So Sri Tukhiti came, take prasad with Prabhupada. Jamuna had cooked. And after only one minute of tasting that prasad, <laughs> Sri Tukhiti had a realization that my cooking compared to Jamuna was so horrible. <laughs> And yet Prabhupada was tolerating it completely. But instead of chastising me, he arranged this situation to let me know that I should learn how to do better prasad. So Prabhupada was so humble. The way he encouraged people indirectly, he never smashed you or, or got on the case and, and, and insulted you or anything like you know we see other devotees do. So he was very special. He was just a very special person. So, all of his qualities. He was just very humble, but also he was an expert singer and, and a harmonium player and cartel player. And because I was musically inclined, I really appreciated how he chanted, his musical ability and uh, his, his knowledge. He could quote shlokas, he knew every shastra. He was so. He was a very impressive personality, very impressive, but so humble. So those are some of the qualities that endeared me to Sri Prabhupada. Okay, thank you very Oh, yeah, one more. Really like you said that temple president chastised you when you have taken the uh, dust of lotus feet of Srila Prabhupada, and when you came back, temple president was angry yeah. and was telling you so many things yeah. and you happily accepted it, it, it didn't bother you much. So no, it didn't bother me that, that my temple president was so heavy and insulting me and telling me I was lower than a worm in stool. <laughs> I was not even a Vaishnava. I just said, yes, yes, you're right. Because I was so happy to have taken the dust of Prabhupada's lotus feet nothing else mattered, you know. So internally I was very happy. So externally I said, yeah, yeah, you're right. My question is that, like for me personally, if someone scolds me or chastises me, even a little bit, not heavily, like uh, I'm not able to take it. And I usually either I, I stop talking to that person or I speak. So <coughs> how to uh, cultivate this quality because yeah, if someone, here's what we should understand. Two things. The first thing is because I had just had that very intimate association with Prabhupada, nothing else mattered. Now, if I hadn't have had that and he had chastised me, then I might have reacted differently. But in that situation, I was internally in bliss, so it didn't matter what he was saying externally. But after studying the Shastra later on, I understood certain things that I didn't understand in the beginning, and I'll share with you. 
When another Vaishnava comes and chastises you and finds your fault, then by doing that, then whatever karma you would have gotten by that fault now goes to him. So once you realize that, when people insult you or find your fault, they're taking away your karma, they're clearing your path back to God, and then you're very happy. And so when someone finds fault with me, I say, oh, thank you very much. Any other faults you noticed? <laughs> That's one thing. But Shastra says, if you react to that, then you nullify that. Then he doesn't take your karma because now you're coming at the same level and you have to be in the transcendental position, then he is accepting your karma. You're offloading it to him because it's a Vaishnava Aparad, because you're behaving like a Vaishnava. But if you don't behave like a Vaishnava and you also behave like a f another fault finder, then he doesn't take your karma. So it's very intelligent to just accept it. Let people find your fault. Let them clear your path back to home, back to Godhead. Right? Yes. Probably it happens in the family. Like my husband, sometimes my, my husband is a very good devotee and he tells so many faults. Like though I should accept happily, not on all the time faults, he appreciates also. But whenever he tells faults, I am not able to accept it. I, I always, either I tell him that, uh, no, no, I am not like this, or I want to uh, hide my uh, means or shortcomings and want to be motivated and don't want to get so much discouragement like that. Well, so don't try to defend yourself. Just think to yourself, he's taking my karma <laughs> and smile. That was one thing. The second thing is Prabhupada said that disagreements between husband and wife are not taken seriously. You don't take them serious. These things happen. He said even there's disagreements in the spiritual world, but everyone's focused on Krishna and no one takes it in a negative way. But if you accept it, then you're behaving like Paka Vaishnava. Your karma is being released, husband is taking. You benefit by not responding in a negative way, even internally. Just say, yes, you're right, I have so many faults. And I remember preaching in Bangladesh when I was there. I met some very humble Hindus. They were so humble. and. Uh, I learned from them what is real humility. They were so humble that I realized, even though they were coming to me saying, you're the most glorious, you're offering Dandavat Pranams, you're a Mahabhagavat. They were so humble, I realized, actually, I'm very fallen. They're the Mahabhagavat. I should be behaving like them. You see? So, over time, we learn how to behave properly. But we should understand philosophically from the Shastra and the teachings to not to respond negatively to negative fault finding. And it's the same with glorification. If someone glorifies you, you don't have to say, yes, you're right. I am the best wife. <laughs> I'm the best cook. I'm the best. You just say, I don't have any, I don't have much qualities. It's all the mercy of Guru and Krishna. You give them the, the credit to Guru and Krishna. So if you glorify, you give the Guru credit to Guru and Krishna. And if they're chastising, you say, yes, you're right. You found my fault. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Srila Prabhupada Ki. Thank you very much.